Happy birthday, Sonic! The Sonic the Hedgehog franchise of games has been around now for 30 years and has influenced the lives of countless individuals, cultures, and high school video game clubs for generations. When we think about the Sonic franchise of games, we often think about a little blue dude rolling around at the speed of sound, chasing his rainbows in colorful, lively worlds. We think about fighting for freedom and justice and stopping Dr. Robotnik's evil plots. We think about teaming up with friends on wild adventures. And we think about identity crises. Right? No? Just me on that last one. Well, what if I told you that you should add that one to your list as well? Buckle up viewers, cause in this two-part Sonic 30th Anniversary special, we are going to talk about how identity is a core theme of the Sonic games. Hello everybody and welcome back to Gospel Centered Gaming, the only place where Jesus saves our games and our lives. My name is Clark, and if this is the first time you've come across this channel, welcome! And if you're wondering, what do we do on this channel, may I recommend the channel trailer found on the channel homepage and in the top right corner. And for those of you returning, welcome back, it's good to see you again, and I'm so glad to come to a new discussion about something that's not Persona, yay! So you might be asking yourself at this point, who exactly is Sonic? Sonic the Hedgehog is Sega's most valuable, though not only, as Sega wants you to think, mascot. Poor Alex Kidd. He's a speedy blue hedgehog who made his Sega Genesis debut on June 23, 1991, and would be Sega's ticket to compete against Nintendo's famous red plumber, Mario. In-game, Sonic has always been portrayed as a righteous, carefree individual who loves his friends and will always fight for justice, especially against the evil hand of his arch-nemesis Dr. Robotnik, aka Dr. Eggman. In Sonic's beginning iterations, story was not as large of an element as it is nowadays and was told more indirectly through the environment, short 16-bit cutscenes, and game manuals. Yeah, who knew those had a purpose? But all that changed when Sonic transitioned into 3D with Sonic Adventure. And yes, I know, there is also Sonic 3D Blast, but we all know that this is the first real 3D Sonic game, okay? Anyway, in Sonic Adventure, we got to see all of our favorite and new favorite characters fleshed out with voice lines, very expressive faces, and involved in an intricate story. But the more direct storytelling of the Sonic series really kicked off with, and some would say has never been as good since, this title's descendant, Sonic Adventure 2. Here, we are introduced to one of Sonic's greatest rivals. So great he even got his own game. Is it Knuckles? Nope. Is it Metal Sonic? Nope. Ah, you all know who I'm talking about. It's Cream! <laughs> I mean Shadow. It probably comes as no surprise to any Sonic fan who was conscious around the mid-2000s that the first video of our two-part Sonic special about identity is going to focus heavily on Shadow, whose entire bit is that he can't remember who he is. I promise you, though, that we will talk about Sonic in the next video. After all, this is the blue dude's 30th birthday. We can't celebrate that without talking about him. For now, though, let's talk about the Edgelord. Shadow is the embodiment of every teenager's angst, black like darkness, red like blood, brooding and aloof and confused. Confused. In his series debut, we see that Shadow is being held in a government facility until he is unleashed by Dr. Robotnik to do his bidding. Though Eggman knows that Shadow was created by his grandfather, Dr. Gerald Robotnik, he does not know much more about him. And neither does Shadow, apparently, because he has amnesia and cannot remember much about who he is or what happened to him before he was sealed away. All Shadow does remember clearly is his friend, Maria, being shot and killed by Gun before she ejected him to Earth. Her dying words continue to ring in his brain. Shadow, I beg of you, please Maria. do it for me, for all the people on that planet. Sayonara, Shadow, the Hedgehog. And Shadow promises Maria. Revenge. We find out, however, that time had warped Shadow's memories, and Maria had not wanted Shadow to enact revenge, but instead to help give people a chance to be happy and have a brighter future. Upon realizing, thanks to Amy Rose, that he had misremembered, Shadow rushes out and teams up with Sonic to stop the Bio-Lizard, sacrificing himself to keep his promise to Maria. This was not the end of the story, however, as Shadow had not died, but instead was being held by Dr. Robotnik in one of his facilities. 
He is, however, stricken with amnesia again. What are the odds of that? Seven. Anyway, he now hardly remembers anything that happened in Sonic Adventure 2, but determines to work with Rouge to find Eggman as repayment for her freeing him and in the hope of finding out some things about himself. Midway through his quest, Shadow sees a broken Shadow android and is clearly disquieted, as the soundtrack puts it. In the last cutscene for Team Dark, Rouge sees a room filled to the brim with Shadow androids, and she, as well as the player, are left wondering if Shadow is an android or the original. This sets the stage for the crux of Shadow's story, which Sega decided was the best thing to focus on in 2005, as it was the mainline game from Sonic Team to come to home consoles that year, though Sonic Rush also came out that year for the DS, but like I said, home consoles. On November 15th, 2005, yes I remember the date, cause like a dork I counted down the days to release, Shadow the Hedgehog the video game for the Nintendo GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox graced this world with its edgy presence and promised to hold the answers to all the questions Sonic fans had about Shadow since his initial debut four years earlier. It featured things unconventional to the Sonic franchise at that point, and even since. Namely, allowing the players to use more realistic guns and characters, mostly Shadow himself, mildly swearing. It also featured much darker themes than usual, such as actively blowing up cities, killing people and other living creatures rather than only robots and other artificial life, and multiple dark endings, such as Shadow expressing intent to destroy the planet, Shadow setting out to conquer the planet, and Shadow even straight up killing Eggman, which I'm sorry to laugh, but just every time I think of the cutscene, it's just so funny. Goodbye, Doctor. The game mechanic that probably sets the game most apart from the rest of the franchise, other than the guns, is the branching pathways. In most of the 22 stages, the player is given the freedom to choose among three objectives in order to complete the level. A dark mission, a normal mission, and a hero mission. Side note, these are also uncoincidentally mostly the same adjectives used to describe the story modes from Sonic Adventure 2, Hero and Dark, and the three types of Chow, Hero, Neutral, and Dark. Where's our new Chow Garden Sonic team? Anyway, depending on whichever one the player chooses, the story and the next stage Shadow enters will change as a result, leading our Edgehog to become a great hero, a horrible villain, or someone in between. This brings us to the tagline of the game, Hero or Villain? You decide. Did you like my edgy narrator voice? I felt like that was a pretty good impression. Thank you very much. Anyway, now to the main point of this video. It's clear that Shadow's story is all about identity. What he does is wrapped up in who he thinks he is. This is why the branching paths exist. Depending on who he believes he is, he sides with different people and does different things. Shadow has worked with Eggman and against Eggman, with Sonic and against Sonic, for gun and against gun, with the black arms and against the black arms, toward revenge against humanity and toward hope for humanity. Shadow is often wavering between right and wrong, good and evil. He is a true anti-hero, and I believe this is a byproduct of his lacking a sense of identity and self-concept. Without a sense of identity or self-concept, without knowing who we are, we often become lost, and it is difficult for us to determine what is right and what is wrong, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. This is a biblical concept that plays itself out in our everyday lives in every person. Though we are not what we do, the Bible is clear that what we do is a product of who we are. For example, scripture tells us that all people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and often elaborates that our human nature is evil. Thus, because we are human and our nature is evil, we tend to do evil, sinful things. Our identity as human naturally leads to the actions of sin and evil. Scripture also elaborates that when we are saved, we are adopted into God's family as sons and daughters of God. When this becomes our identity, Scripture explains, we are then able to please God by doing what is right. A great example of someone who has lost their identity and therefore lost their way is the prodigal son. In case you don't know the story, there were two sons living with a father who was rich, a young son and an older son. The young son tells his father, Father, I want my cut of the inheritance and I'm leaving. Which is essentially him saying that he wishes his father was dead so he can get his half of his stuff. The father surprisingly agrees and gives him his inheritance. The son leaves and then squanders it all. A famine then comes into the land and now being extremely poor because he squandered all his money, he can't afford to eat 
and has to take any job he can get, so he becomes a helping hand on a pig farm, which for the Jewish people was possibly the lowest thing that you could do. He had been brought so low that he starts to envy the pigs and wish that he could eat their food. After spending his entire inheritance and almost starving to death, it says he came to himself. He remembered who he was, his father's son, and though he did not feel worthy to be called his son anymore, this was enough to get him back to where he needed to be, under his father's care. And when he returned, the father did not equate his actions with his identity, but instead let his son's identity as his son dictate what should be done. The father throws him a party. It did not matter to the father that his son had essentially told him to screw off and then squandered everything he gave him. What mattered to the father was that his son had returned safely, and that was reason to celebrate. That's really only half the story, because we haven't talked about the older son, but we're focusing on the younger son here. Shadow also has a prodigal moment of some sort. In the last story of Shadow the Hedgehog, Shadow decides to give Goku, I mean Black Doom, the seven Chaos Emeralds with the hope that he will uphold his end of the bargain, reveal to him the secrets of his past. Black Doom delivers and reveals to Shadow that he is also a black alien, as Dr. Gerald Robotnik, Shadow's creator, enlisted Black Doom's help in bringing Shadow to life. In exchange, Gerald promised that Shadow would deliver Black Doom the Seven Chaos Emeralds when the comet returned in 50 years. Meanwhile, while Shadow is confronting Doom, Team Chaotix finds the secret data files from the Ark and unintentionally start broadcasting it across the globe. Gerald addresses Shadow as his son and explains to Shadow that what Black Doom is saying is true. He goes on to explain that he actually invented the Eclipse Cannon in order to destroy the Black Comet upon its return, not to destroy the Earth as he had claimed in his madness in Sonic Adventure 2. Gerald and Maria then commission Shadow to destroy the Comet with the Eclipse Cannon and ensure peace and a brighter future for humanity. Shadow is then reinvigorated by the realization of his true identity and purpose and uses the Chaos Emeralds to become Super Shadow. Shadow then flies off to fight Devil Doom, the super form of Black Doom, to defeat the Black Arms once and for all. During that fight, Eggman also confirms that the Shadow we are playing as is indeed the original Shadow from Sonic Adventure 2 and not an android. With his identity secured, Shadow defeats Devil Doom and leaves his traumatic past behind him now looking toward a hopeful future. So, through his experience, Shadow comes to understand his purpose for being created, to ensure peace and prosperity for mankind. But this video isn't about purpose, it's about identity. These two concepts are often interchanged, but they are very different. Purpose has everything to do with what we are meant to do in this life. Identity has everything to do with who we are. Gerald explained a lot about Shadow's purpose, and Shadow himself identifies his purpose after Gerald's message is finished, stating, Now I understand why I'm here. But he does not say, This is who I am! in all caps, like every other ending of the game, which is the entire theme of the game, heck even the theme song of the game. So what gives? Did Shadow gain a sense of identity by the end of Shadow the Hedgehog? Actually, despite everything I just pointed out, I believe so, and it comes in one little detail I mentioned earlier that you might have caught. Gerald, at the beginning of his message to Shadow, addresses Shadow as his son. This is the only time we ever see or hear this title given to Shadow. Most times, Shadow is Professor Gerald's creation, experiment, or project, but here he is his son. There is a huge difference between being someone's creation and being someone's child. A creator uses his creation, owns his creation, commands his creation, but a parent loves a child. I think that it is not only that Shadow was given a direct instruction on his purpose that invigorated him to defeat Black Doom, but also this new understanding of his identity as Professor Gerald Robotnik's son. This new identity empowered him to have compassion on humanity and the Earth and to fight to protect from destruction. This same distinction between creation and child, I would argue, is a central theme of the gospel. We are all God's creations. The entirety of the universe is God's creation, capital C. And God uses, owns, and commands his creation accordingly. But God, being the good father, loves his children. And as is explained so well by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament book of Romans, it is our new identities as children of God that free us from sin and death. 
In this amazing analogy, Paul explains that when we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose to life three days later, we are justified before God, meaning all of our disobedience against God is forgiven and we are made to be in good standing with him, for Jesus has taken on the punishment we deserve. He goes on to say that on top of being reconciled to God, we are also, when we believe, adopted into his family as sons and daughters, as we mentioned earlier. This theme is strewn throughout scripture. Scripture also assures us that along with being children of God, believers are also gifted the Holy Spirit, one of the three persons of the Trinity, as a helper to empower us to fulfill our God-given purpose by sanctifying us, making us holy and more like Jesus, giving us hope, developing in us the characteristics of God, also known as the fruit of the Spirit, as well as spiritual giftings, teaching and instructing us, and much more. And what is this God-given purpose, you may ask? Ultimately, it is to be righteous and obedient, following God's commands as acts of love for him and others. This is the purpose the Holy Spirit empowers us to fulfill. In short, God identifies believers as his children, and this identity enables us to fulfill the purpose he has given us. Does this not sound so familiar to what we just saw in Shadow's story? Gerald identified Shadow as his son, instructed him on his purpose, and thereby enabled him to fulfill said purpose. With his now clear identity and purpose, Shadow is able to act in an unwavering manner, certain of what is right because of his certainty in his identity. So, through this convoluted story, Shadow shows us two strong points about identity. One, when we don't have a strong self-concept or identity, we waver between right and wrong, and we often feel lost. And two, when we have a secure identity, we are empowered to fulfill our purpose. So what about you guys? Do you feel secure in your identity? And what did you think about this analysis of Shadow's story? Leave a comment below and let me know what you think. And make sure to be on the lookout for the next video that's going to be coming out next week. If you want to make sure to watch it right when it comes out, be sure to hit subscribe and hit the bell to receive notifications for all of my uploads. Also, if you liked the video, make sure to leave a like. It's greatly appreciated and helps me know what kind of content you guys like to see in the future. Anyway, I've been Clark. This has been Gospel Centered Gaming, and I hope you all have a wonderfully blessed day. God bless.